Good morning, everybody. Um, I came back to uh, the UK in February and was given the opportunity to get involved in this particular project. And it was critical to us as an organization in terms of being able to access infrastructure to unlock the potential that we have. But I didn't recognize that it would actually give me access to all the people that I needed to talk to in order to make that happen, but also access to their expertise and their passion and enthusiasm for this subject. And I have to say that I'd just like to acknowledge that because that's what's going to unlock the future of the basin in the f as we go forward, is that people genuinely want to create a different future. So two words that I'm going to use as we go forward, and this little piece of artwork is courtesy of one of the team, um, a budding artist. Um, but it describes the terminology of a hub as we use it in this conversation. And we should bear in mind that when these, the initial infrastructure was put in place, nobody envisaged that it would have the potential to become a hub and last far longer than anybody expected or that its nameplate capacity suggested that it would. And what we've been doing is looking at all the potential reserves associated with these key dominant hubs trying to identify what is the future potential at various stages associated with that hub. I'm going to use that word quite a bit. The other word I'm going to use is criticality of infrastructure because we were tasked with finding a criticality map as we went forward for the North Sea. We're not using criticality of the sense of this hub produces a lot today, therefore it's important. We're using criticality in the sense of if this hub doesn't actually exist, what's going to happen in the future? What's the outcome for that area? And is it, are the reserves there critical enough that we should have a different conversation about what exists today? So in order to do this, we've worked very closely with Hannon and Westwood in order to produce a model that we think answers the questions that we wanted to put to it. We came up with a standard set of variables, pick and choose your gas price, but we needed a standardization for looking at the three areas, the Northern North Sea, the Central North Sea, and the Southern North Sea. And we've been working, it was obvious to us initially that it, it's not just possible to go out there and do a study of the whole of the North Sea unless you really understand what you're looking for and what the answers you're going to get. And so we did a lot of work initially on the Northern North Sea, looking at a, taking that as a pilot and testing amongst ourselves, were we getting the right kind of resources and answers that we were looking for? We ran a bunch of sensitivities. Yes, it's just a model, but we, having this ability to work closely with owners and users who are part of this team, constantly testing the results to see if they make sense, we hope will give us a model that can actually be used in the future. Because if we can't generate a useful piece of information that changes the future, it's been a bit of a waste of time. Before I get on to hubs themselves, I think it's also important that we actually recognize what's going on with the pipeline story. And what these graphs represent is in black at the top what the ICOP nameplated capacity of any given pipeline infrastructure is. So these graphs represent Northern North Sea, Southern North Sea, Central North Sea broken down into oil and gas. And it, they demonstrate through time, data, I think it goes back to sort of the early 70s through to where we are today, the line in red represents what the actual usage of that capacity has been. And as you can see, there's actually quite a gap. I mean, in, in the Northern North Sea, it's probably only 10% of the capacity is being utilized for oil today. The other point that I'll come back to, but I'd like you just to note, is that with regard to the FPSOs, in recent years, we've seen this uptake in FPSOs. Theoretically, the capacity of this, those FPSOs actually exists within the infrastructure that is there today. So that's just a point. But 
So the issue, Nigel's referred to it, there's not an issue getting into pipelines, there's not a capacity issue, so it brings us back to the hubs. And what we've been trying to do is get an understanding through looking at whether a um, whether you take 25, 45, or 65 kilometer tiebacks, what reserves, risked reserves, are potentially dependent on a given infrastructure? What has a choice? What's totally reliant so that if that hub doesn't exist, that's, there's no future? And what is big enough and ugly enough to stand on its own doesn't matter what anybody else's does, we can get these reserves out. And so this is an, an example from the Northern North Sea, but you'll also notice that there are, whilst there may be a phenomenal number of opportunities, a lot of them are actually very small. Perhaps only 13, I think, are above 20. We've also taken, for each hub, an example and just said, if you produce what the hydrocarbons that are there today, What's the story? In this particular case, same hub, it closes in 2019. If you take all of the upside, the risk infill and the risk DNA, then theoretically you could go out to 2035. But is it realistic? Look at the number of different fields that you have to bring on year on year in order to extend it. We all know that in practical terms, that's not going to happen. You're not going to have a hub sat out there that says, yep, I'm up for tying back every year a new independent field. We've got to be able to look at the timing of that ENA activity, how we tie it together, how we get different linkages as we go forward in order to move this game. Tariffs are not enough on an individual field of this size to keep the hub going. And we've got to be able to look at cost share and alternative models for the future. What we're trying to get to, and we're not there yet, is a criticality map for the North Sea. Just taking the Northern North Sea as an example, for instance, theoretically, if the Ninian field shut down in the near future, all of the reserves associated with that field today could actually be taken up by another hub if you assume a 25 or 45k uh, tieback distance. However, if you shut Magnus down, theoretically, there's a large volume, about 140 mm BOE, that has nowhere to go. So, I didn't want to pick particularly on Magnus, but are the owners of Magnus actually thinking in terms of there's some potential out there, how can I exploit all of that? Well, no, because that's not their business. This is a competitive market. Today, they're just worried about their own, or potentially worried about their own infrastructure and their own resources. So our aim is to generate a map like this for the whole of the North Sea that we can then look at in a different way as an industry, as UK PLC, and say, is there a different way of getting the resources out? Some other observations about the Northern North Sea. Um, multiple export options remain. At 45 kilometers, most fields actually have two, two choices. Theoretically, given the ullage in the pipeline, everything could be exported through one line. Now, try telling that to the owners and we might end up in court tomorrow, but it's a possibility. Does it make us look at this area in a different way? Today, all the hubs close at 2036, according to the model, but they all have this issue of space, load, processing capability, and the number of tie-ins per year. These are real challenges that the industry has to be able to take on and get over in order to unlock the future. But potentially, in terms of risk opportunity, there could be as much as 1.4 billion barrels remaining in this area. However, when we look at it, and obviously the unrisked number is kind of off the scale, but even if you look at the risked number from our modeling today, Half of that, 
potentially will never get to a hub because the timing of the ENA activity relative to the hub closure is such that we don't, it's, it's just not going to work on the model basis that we've got today. But that's the size of the prize. So the first 700 theoretically can be developed with a fair wind, but there's, there's still 700 that quite frankly today we haven't got a solution to, but that's a large volume to think about. Slightly different issues emerging on the CNS. So in terms of the graphs that I've shown, it's just an example, but we've got that level of detail for all hubs. When you look at the CNS, we're getting similar stories in terms of the volume is out there, but a different picture emerging. Now, this graph, clearly chaotic. What does that represent? It represents the fact that at 25, 45, and 65 kilometers, actually there's a lot, lot of optionality in the Central North Sea. The circles in green represent hubs that are traditional in terms of going through normal infrastructure. Those in blue represent the FPSOs. Now, as I pointed out earlier, in terms of ullage, the FPSOs have come in, but theoretically, they weren't necessary in terms of pipeline capacity. So what is it that's driving us to put FPSOs in? Is it that there's a different tax story? Is it that people want to be in charge of their own destiny? Is it the fact that actually there are commercial blockers, as Nigel has related to, that we, it, in the time scale that the deck has given us to export those resources, we can't actually go through the infrastructure because it's taking too damn long. We need to understand which of these issues is really causing us to go down this route and then look, particularly at the western margin, um, there are phenomenal resources still to be developed in the central North Sea. How can we unlock those, utilize the infrastructure that's already there, and allow everybody to get an economic solution to the problem. In terms of the Southern North Sea, we're not quite so advanced. So we started with the Northern North Sea, when we, then we went to Central. Um, in terms of the Southern North Sea, in fact, we're actually spending some time immediately after this session looking at what are the results of the Southern North Sea. But already we know that there is an economic challenge that is different about this area to the rest of the North Sea. We've got rising costs, rising operating costs, rising cost of capital, and yet the revenues from a gas stream are only 50% of the oil. So we already know that we're going to have to come up with a different solution, and indeed we've seen in terms of recent fields like Cygnus that has needed a tax allowance to get it over the line. We're going to have to work together in a different way again in order to unlock the potential of the Southern North Sea. Now, I don't know if there are any tough mudders in the audience. Um, this is a 13-kilometer challenge that includes ice baths, electric shocks, and 10-foot high walls. I didn't do it myself, but my son participated. And as I was watching all these groups try and get over this wall, I was struck by the similarity to the problem that we're facing today. If you're tall enough and ugly enough, it doesn't matter. You can do what the hell you like. You can get over the wall. If you're a wily Scotsman that does parkour training and is taught how to get over immovable objects, you can also scale the wall. But everybody else, particularly when you're muddy and down in the weeds, needs a hand up or a leg up in order to get over the wall, or somebody sitting on the top, kind of pulling you over the top. That's where we are today. We're facing a challenge. It's not a race. We know the resources are there. We've got an opportunity, but it means we've actually got to team up and work together in order to access it. So we're not finished. We've got a way to go, but we are beginning to see the story. Significant resources in the Northern North Sea, excess ullage capacity, we need to tie up the fact that the resources are there and the fact that there's a pipeline there and somehow work on the blocker, which is around the host, in, or completely bypass it in order to come up with a solution. Central North Sea, we've got to focus on understanding what the FPSO story is 
and long term, whether that's going to be a help or a hindrance. And Southern Law C, we've got to work on an economic challenge. So going forward, we've still got some verification work to do. What we didn't want to do was put out into the industry a report that somebody could point to and say, that's a load of rubbish. We need to work interactively with both owners and users in terms of understanding, have we got the model right? Because we're trying to produce a product that will help change the way we go forward. In terms of the Southern Law Sea, more work today and subsequent verification. I've tried to be dynamic and present to you in a very short space of time what we're doing. But there are people in the audience that need to get more involved and probably see on a hub-by-hub -hub basis what this analysis is so that you can look at your, your infrastructure, your, your licenses in a different way and work out how you can work in this new emerging world. So we're proposing that on the 25th of September, we work with Hannon and Westwood and they actually present in more detail each hub and all of the challenges around that particular hub, just to give you the right level of insight. 25th of September may or may not work, but Paul's going to work on how we set that up. And then ultimately, we're going to produce a report in November um, that we hope will give people something to think about, a new way of looking at this basin. So that's where we are. Um, Hannah and Westwood, fortunately, are in the room too, so if anybody's got any questions about the details of the model, but more to come in the future. Um, so what I'm going to do now is hand over to Mark, who's been working quite closely with us as a group, with his team, because they're trying to take the data that we're producing and say, okay, now we, we're getting an idea of what the issues are. What are those things that we need to do to unlock the potential in the future? Thanks very much.